Almighty Father in heaven, it is in the sacred name of your Son, our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, that we approach you this morning. And Father, as we this Sunday remember the choice that Jesus made to place himself in the hands of man to come to the yield to the judgment of man and to pay the price for our sins. We must rejoice and give thanks, O Lord, for this precious gift, for the hope that it instills within our hearts, for the opportunity that it presents in our lives, for the blessing that it is to all of the earth. Father, we thank you this morning for those who shared with us. We thank you this morning for the glorious beauty of this day. We pray, Father, as we assemble to worship, that you will bless our speaker this morning, that his words and his thoughts might be directed and guided. And we pray that our hearts might be open to receive that message that he would share. We pray, Lord, that we might each rejoice today for the precious gift of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit might touch our hearts and our minds, that we truly might worship you and learn of you today. And we ask it in the sacred name of he who gave his life for us. Amen. Good morning. Boy, we, Zacchaeus has grown a lot in the last 2,000 years. I want to welcome you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We appreciate the fact that you have taken time out of your lives to come and to worship with us today. We also welcome those who may be watching online. I am personally blessed this morning because we have a family member with us that we don't often get to see, and she's come to church with us this morning down from, from Branson. And then once I got to church, I saw three of my Pensacola Church family members who are here from Colorado, and so it's uh, uh, very touching, and uh, I feel very blessed this morning. I, I trust and pray that we have come with that degree of preparation that would allow us to receive of that good spirit that God wishes to bestow upon us today. I, I hope and trust that you continue to lift up David as he finishes his preparation to share with us those words that have come to him that would be pleasing to our Heavenly Father and beneficial to us. Every Sunday is a special Sunday. Every, every Sunday is a unique Sunday. And today is certainly no exception. Today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day that Christ entered into Jerusalem. And as we, we just saw with the children, it was the day that the, the palm branches were were strode before the Christ as he came into the, to the city. It was, this is the day that begins that last week of his earthly ministry, that week that culminates, the, the focus of everything begins to become sharper, and it culminates with the, the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And, and please don't fall into that, uh, that trap of thinking that, that Christ somehow is, 
it said that he, in his ministry, sort of lost control, and he, he, he was arrested, and he was beaten, and he was interrogated, and ultimately he was murdered. That's not true at all. Christ presided over all of those events. Christ presides over all things. And it was from the foundation of the world that he chose to be crucified for you and for me. And so during this service and during uh, this upcoming week, I, I hope that we keep these thoughts in, our, in the forefront of our minds of, uh, of what this week represents and, and how it culminates with next weekend. Our call to worship this morning, um, if, if you ever watch football games, you've, you've seen the first verse that we're going to read, John 3.16. Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the next verse, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And as we approach that Palm Sunday, people from regions round about began coming into Jerusalem. Uh, the Passover was coming, but also many people had heard of this Jesus and they wanted to know more about him. Some wanting to follow, some just being curious. But all of these people were gathering, and the disciples came to Jesus, and they told him about all of these people and all of these things that were going on. And in John 12, 23, Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. May God bless us and have mercy on us as we continue to try to be that people that he would have us to be. Just a reminder, if you have not done so, the offering plates are back by the doors to drop your donations. I'm going to read, this is a familiar scripture from Mark chapter 12, verses 47 to 50. And after this, Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow... And she cast in two mites, which make a farthing. And Jesus called her, called his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they who have cast into the treasury. For all the rich did cast in of their abundance. But she, notwithstanding her want, did cast in all that she had, yea, even all her living." God cares more about the attitude in which we give than the amount which we give. Bow with me. Father in heaven, thank you for this glorious day that you have made. Help us remember the sacrifice that your son made that we might be granted everlasting life. I ask that you would bless the offerings that are presented this morning. They would be allocated in the accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. While I get settled, if you want to get your swords out and turn to the book of Mark, chapter 4, We'll be reading a scripture from there, and I'll be briefly reading from 2 Nephi chapter 13 also. You know, we call it the sword because in the book of Ephesians, they describe the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and so we talk about carrying our swords around. I recently asked my senior high class if now with the advent of electronic scriptures, we should refer to them as lightsabers. And... 
I got a mixed opinion, so we'll try that out for a while and see if it settles. Um, it's a beautiful day today. It's a beautiful spring day that we get to enjoy by the light of the sun that rose this morning, just as it's a beautiful day that we get to enjoy by the light of the sun who rose for us. And today we celebrate Palm Sunday, my senior high class. What's my favorite holiday on the Christian calendar? Palm Sunday. We have many holy days on our Christian calendar where we remember all the things that God does and did for us. But Palm Sunday stands unique from those others as God's creation participated and added value and meaningfulness to that day as the multitudes were there uh, celebrating their king as we got to enjoy um, the kids sharing with us this morning. So I want to talk about Palm Sunday this morning. I want to share with you, as I did briefly, why I've, I've always enjoyed and found uplift uh, from that multitude that day, but also kind of how I've begun to reevaluate uh, even my own preferences. Um, and I want to make sure that I do a good job of tying that to our monthly theme and do so by using the parable that I described in Mark chapter 4. So our, our monthly theme comes from the Doctrine and Covenants, I'm sorry, the Book of Mormon, uh, 2 Nephi chapter 13, which Mark preached on last week and gave us a homework assignment to read. But our monthly assignment uh, and our monthly theme came after Nephi was talking about uh, entering into a covenant with God and whether that was the last thing that was important for us to do. And he says, no. For you have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. And it finishes in verse 32. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. So I want to talk and make sure we end up heading down this path that, that brings us back to that brightness of hope which we seek to have in our lives. And now if you're in Mark chapter 4, there's a parable that Jesus shares here, the parable of the sower. And it's very familiar uh, to us in the New Testament. Because there was a sower that went forth, and he, he, as he preaches the parable to the multitude, he then describes its meaning to his disciples later, where he tells us that the sower went to sow seed, which was the word of God. And the people, the four circumstances that the seed fell on, represent the response of the people to that message of God in their life. There were some seeds that fell by the wayside. And the fowls of the air came and devoured those up. That's verse 4 of chapter 4 in Mark. And in verse 5, some of the seed fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Then there was some seed that fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up along with the seed and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And finally, the fourth example was that there was seed that fell on good ground. And it did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And so as I think about that parable of the sower and think about the people that Jesus is talking about, I try to create caricatures of those people and how they might respond. Because as I told you, I've always been impressed. I've always wanted to be a part of that multitude that worshiped their king, recognized Jesus for who he was in his earthly ministry on Palm Sunday. But the truth is that it wasn't just a group, a singular group of one people. It was a complex group of many people coming from many places with many backgrounds. And undoubtedly, in that crowd, there were Mr. Waysides. There were Mr. Stonies. There were Mr. Thorns. And there had to have been some Mrs. Good Grounds. Now, 
It's by no coincidence that the three what not to do's I've called the misters and the one response we should give as the misses. Because it's a reminder to me from my own personal experience that men often need to learn a lesson multiple times. But there were two days and there were two crowds. There was the multitude described in the Gospels that met Jesus on Palm Sunday and worshipped him. There is also the multitude that's described in the Gospels that came out on Friday to Jesus' trial before Pilate and called for his crucifixion. But for those brief moments in time, there had to have been people in both of those crowds that matched these descriptions. Mr. Wayside was probably only there if it was convenient. Undoubtedly, he saw some tweet about Jesus and came out to see what was the fuss. But the slightest bit of skepticism would have kept that message from Jesus, of Jesus from settling into his heart, and he would have been left thinking Jesus to be a charlatan and a madman. He may or may not have come back out on Friday for the spectacle of the trial, but either way, good riddance. Young people know there really weren't tweets back then. Mr. Stoney would have come out at the news of the prophesied Messiah of Israel, the one that had been waited for for generations. And while witnessing him on Sunday entering Jerusalem, he would have already begun mentally bending those prophetic promises to fit the struggles and oppressions of his day and how this Messiah was going to save him in a nationalistic way, as we talked about in our morning worship. Among other things, Mr. Stoney would have been sizing up Jesus to see if he would actually be able to overthrow this Roman occupation. But come Friday, after a week of activity that did not match what the Savior should be doing, he would have undoubtedly been offended, as the parable of the sower says that this man is not who he thought the Messiah should be. Mr. Thorne was probably not unlike Mr. Stoney in his early enthusiasm. The seed would have fallen and bore fruit initially. But if you go through the gospel accounts of Jesus' teachings that week, you find words that were sharp and lessons that were hard. And you find a focus on the religious elite of that day and not on the Romans as what he would have expected. And because these words were sharp and the lessons hard and the sacrifice that was required not matching the amount of effort that Mr. Thorne would have wanted to give, he wouldn't have been able to be that follower because, you know, there's a lot of other things going on in life. And if this guy wasn't even going to save himself as he should be able to do, what great loss is another man put to death on a cross because he was hardly the first. So Mr. Thorne's hope would quickly be choked and unfruitful. But then there's Mrs. Goodground, Gigi. She was probably there on both days. Maybe she was vocal. Maybe she wasn't. On Friday, maybe she was unwavering in her, in her faith, that unlike the disciples, she was able to see and trust that divine plan from the foundation of the world, even when the methods that Jesus used seemed unusual, or maybe she was clinging desperately to any brightness of hope against what was happening before her very eyes. But there were probably many Mrs. Gigi's in that crowd that after that day remained devoted to the seed that was planted in her through the ministry of Christ, and she endured the best that she could through that difficult day and the difficult days to come, bearing fruit of different amounts. Now, if we meditate on a finished day in our life, we will most likely find that we are a combination of these responses at different times. Because just as those were not singular crowds, we are not singular, simple um, people. 
I want to quickly layer this idea with the story of the prodigal son, because we've talked about and, and, and heard about this parable recently here. It's important as we reflect on our day that we find those moments where we were Mr. Wayside, Mr. Stony, or Mr. Thorn. Because like in that parable, it's important for us to acknowledge our shortcomings so that we avoid the self-righteous tendencies of the older brother. It was those self-righteous tendencies that led him to choose not to be a part of the celebration that his father was offering. But there are others of us, and there are other times in all of our lives, when as we reflect upon our day, and we find overwhelming grief, frustration, when I find that I don't find any good ground responses, that there's no GG in my story. And like the prodigal son, the word finds no root in our lives. We find no hope at all that leads us or compels us or gives us any desire to return to our father who wants us. But somewhere through that story and somewhere in our lives, there has to be that moment and that seed that begins that process where we find that hope. And as that seed is planted, then we begin We begin what can be a very long and difficult journey home. You know, you put these thoughts together and it's calm and, and rational and then you stand up here and it becomes emotional. And I never understood that as a kid. But now I do and I blame genetics. And just recognizing this problem that we have, recognizing where we're at, does not mean that the solution is easy. It doesn't mean that the voices stop whispering in our ear. But it does mean one thing important. that If you have shared this experience with me, you are not alone. And you are not left alone. Those first steps are difficult. But as important as that first step is, is to recognize that you are a complex person. This is a complex life. We live in a complex world. And those crowds, both on Palm Sunday, were not singular, but they were composed of a complex group of people as well on Sunday and on Friday. Now, I think this view, beginning to understand who was there and the types of people that were there, is certainly more interesting and probably realistic view of the compositions of those crowds than what I might have had in the past. It doesn't mean that I love Palm Sunday any less, but I begin to understand how that impacts me and what I can do with it. But I don't want to stay here too long or dwell on these caricatures too long because I don't want you to get too clear a view of their faces. Because just as I don't want to label the Sunday and the Friday crowds together as either good or bad, I don't want to categorize any individual person then or now as inherently good or bad. But I want us to think upon the struggle which we have between our faith and our lack thereof and the message and hope of the gospel that supports us in that process. To reiterate, it's not my purpose this morning to put you into character category by using this analogy. Now, I love a good Enneagram as much as the next person. But there's only one category level that we are really concerned about, and that category is about being redeemed. We know that children are redeemed because of their innocence, 
which is why we love them so much. But for the rest of us, anyone bearing the stain of sin, the cost of your redemption came in the life of Christ. Now, was Gigi worth the cost? Well, yes, of course. She bore good fruit. But what about Thorn and Stony and Wayside? Were they worth the cost? Well, yes, they were, but not necessarily because of our natural logic. Because if their actions are what define them, then the cost would not be justified, as that would be a very poor investment because no fruit was born in their lives. And God would not be a very good steward of the life of his son. It's only if all of us are in the redeemed category and that mercy has its claim and that God is not a respecter of persons and it's not our failures and shortcomings that define us and dictate our value that this gospel message makes sense and connects. They don't define our present value or our future value. And this is easy to say, not always easy for me to believe. It can be hard at times for me to convince myself of this truth. Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears to wonders I confess, the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. Words penned by Elizabeth Cecilia Clefane, a Scottish lady in 1868, a year before she passed. But words that bring to life the feelings I have in my heart. Because if I impose my version, my superficial version of justice and fairness at the level that we often do in our lives, then our version of the gospel story would have been that Jesus would have come in on Palm Sunday before the adoring crowd that recognized him as a king and died for those people because they were worth it and the children. Not the Friday crowd. Listen to the Friday crowd. Matthew chapter 27, verse 7. After Pilate gave them every opportunity to set this man free and told them that he was washing his hands of his guilt. And verse 27, then answered all the people and said, his blood come upon us and our children. As a bold statement. And while that common voice, I understand, could be present there, again, I say, I don't think that rejects the idea that there were silent people there trying to figure out what the situation was, certainly not vocal, as we know the disciples weren't in their hesitancy. May his blood come upon us and our children. Keep that in mind as these antagonists of Christ that day were crying out, and compare that with what we read in the book of Acts chapter 5, when Peter and John are being brought before the religious leaders of that day after they've been told to stop preaching about this Jesus, but they wouldn't do it, and the religious council, the high priest in verse 28 of Acts chapter 5, said, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. All of a sudden, they didn't want these Leaders didn't want what the crowd on Friday was asking for. But the really interesting thing about this, of course, is that turn of phrase, because the apostles' intent and Jesus' intent, of course, is to bring his blood upon them and us for its saving power. But it wasn't about the crowds. It's not about that superficial logic that I have. It was about the complex, broken individuals within the Sunday crowd and the Friday crowd. It was not because of them, but it was for those moments that we were anecdotally calling Mr. Wayside, Mr. Stoney, Mr. Thorne, and Mrs. Goodground. 
But if our actions are not permanent categories, but whether those actions be good or bad, they are a response to the gift that was already given to us based on that category that matters, is that we are God's. And if we fall into that category, then we have that promise of redemption. Mrs. Good Ground is worth it. Mr. Wayside is worth it. Mr. Stoney is worth it. And Mr. Thorne is worth it as well. So starting here today, while we must encounter the individual shortcomings of those caricatures, because that impacts us, not because we are permanently stuck playing that part, but because, as Jacob outlines in his book in the Book of Mormon, that God has promised that he will help us overcome those tendencies. We must face them as the prodigal son had to face his tendencies as well in order to make his journey back to his father. So I want to make sure I recap this mental process that I'm going through to make sure I've articulated myself well. You know my initial fondness for Palm Sunday and why that's there. But it's not accurate as we look backwards in time to consider the entire Palm Sunday multitude to be the good guys and the crowd that was present on the crucifixion day to be the bad guys. Those were complex social organisms that we know very little about in the record that's left for us. And we do an injustice by glancing at them and throwing them in a box. Similarly, we are complex spiritual organisms that cannot be fairly analyzed by a passing glance and then tossed into a box, either good or bad. If so, heaven forbid that we be judged by our Friday selves and not our Sunday selves. Now, in the same way we want to reject this quick rationalization that the Sunday folks be saved and the Friday folks receive their due punishment, we have to ponder the depth and the breadth of the grace and mercy of God, which compelled Christ to make his sacrifice by the hands of those who sought to make him their enemy and include them in the gift? What kind of love is this? I have two takeaways for us today. First, we have to be careful of our own wayside, stony, and thorn tendencies. And we've got to seek to cultivate our GG, our good ground. Because the fruit of these efforts is that we will see the brightness of our hope increasing, as Nephi talked about in his book. And that is a part of the gospel of Christ and this walk that we have in this world. In reflecting upon how God blessed our congregation, in his pastoral efforts last year during the shutdown, Jason remarked on Wednesday night, I know he doesn't like to be quoted because it can be misquoted, but I wrote it down quickly. He noted that our experiences, both trials and blessings, with God give us a firm and fast hope that he will be with us when we need him most. Our experiences with God give us a firm and fast hope that he will be with us when we need him the most. And it's only through that process of growing in our relationship with Christ that that brightness grows. And the nice thing I like about that, it doesn't matter where you start. If you start and you begin your relationship very close to him, you will benefit from that. If you have walked away and have a long way to go, that walk can be difficult, I know. But there is a path for all, and it's different for all. But the promise is the same. These are the seeds that find place in our hearts and begin to bear fruit. Now, does this mean that Jason has had a perfect brightness of hope the entire year? Does it mean that his hope will be unwavering in the future? Probably not. But does that call into question his redemption or his value? No. Because he was created by God the Father, ransomed by God the Son, and indwelt by God the Spirit. And he will justify this investment of creation 
by God the Father and sacrificed by God the Son for the benefit of his own soul by responding to those things and growing in that brightness of hope and bearing fruit in his life. And if we respond internally, if we make those accountings and make those small steps of progress, we will begin to see outward fruit. Which leads me to my second takeaway. We must be careful of our judgments and our categorizations of waysides, stonies and thorns, and others. Whether we see these judgments and dispersions in the news, or whether we experience them in our own presence, as followers of Christ, we must reject them. And we must be willing to stand with people, those that look like us and sound like us, and those that don't, and possibly even those that hold diametrically opposing views to what we hold, because their value in God's eyes is not defined by the views that they hold, just as ours isn't either. In fact, I think as you search your heart and find that a brightness of hope begins to grow within you, see if you don't feel compelled to seek out those in the Friday crowd and the Sunday crowd who do hold those different views, who don't have that hope that you have, and see if you don't have an opportunity and a desire to share with them the hope and promise of redeeming love displayed on the cross at Calvary and empowered by the testimony of the empty tomb. And I hope that if you take upon you that homework assignment and go through that process, and as you begin to create that common ground with people, I hope that among and within that common ground, you find some good ground to plant that seed in Christ, which gives us that perfect brightness of hope. And in and, and 2 Nephi 13, that perfect brightness of hope comes along with something else. It says it gives us a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God, of God and of all men. May you be blessed as you meditate on these things this week and prepare for our annual celebration and commemoration of the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please stand. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your abundant goodness in our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the, the worship that was presented by our youth this morning. And we thank you for their preparation and the message that they shared. Lord, we thank you, as our brother shared, of your abundant grace that is sufficient for each and every one of us. We thank you for the atoning sacrifice of your Son, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that your Spirit might dwell in each one of us, that the fallow ground of our hearts might be turned up, that there might reside place within our hearts, the Word to grow and bear fruit. And as such, we might be known by the love that we share abroad, the care that we have for one another. Lord, I ask that you would bless us in the week to come. I pray that uh, the thoughts and the words that our brother has shared this day as we celebrate Palm Sunday, as we look forward to celebrating that empty tomb, I pray that our hearts and minds might be focused on that. Bless us as we go forward. We thank you again for your abundant goodness in our lives. And we ask these things humbly in your name, in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.